So the word in Arabic is kafir, and kafir literally means a farmer. What does that have to do with farm? What does infidelity have to do with farming? You see, the farmer, he takes a seed and he covers it over. Right? He hides it. So the Quran describes a true kafir, a true infidel, or a non-believer. It says, وَلَا تَلْبِسُوا الْحَقَّ بِالْبَاتِلِ وَتَقْتُمُوا الْحَقَّ وَأَنْتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ do not clothe the truth with falsehood, nor distort the truth while you have knowledge of the truth. Right? While you have knowledge of the truth. So someone who's a kafir, we have to be very careful as Muslims when we throw terminology around. Right? We use the word haram, this is forbidden, this person's a kafir, so on and so forth. You see, there's a difference between someone who's a kafir as a legal distinction or a state distinction in a Muslim country. You're either Muslim or you're not. Right? Yeah, that's in the legal sense. But the faith sense, that's ultimately only known by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's known by God. So many of our theologians, the dominant opinion amongst our theologians is not so much black and white. Right? I use Imam Ghazali again as my kind of my model, as my kind of core theologian, who says that in order for infidelity to be established, a person must have aqal, must be badat, salamatu hawas, wa badabatu adawatu sahiha. Four criteria. He says the person must be an adult. They must have sound intellect. They must have sound senses, you know, sight and hearing. And the prophetic summons reach that person in a good form. And then they reject it. A prophetic summons, either from Jesus or Moses or Muhammad, peace be upon all of them. Right? So, for example, what if you were born in Nottingham in the fourth century? And all you know about is. Well, I guess it would be after that, because Christianity didn't come until a little bit later. But anyway, let's say 11th century. And all you know about Muslims is they're infidels who have taken the Holy Land, and they're slaughtering babies in the streets of Jerusalem, and that's all you know about Muslims. Then many Muslim theologians will say, well, the prophetic summons, the true essence of the prophetic message, did not reach that person in a good form. So you cannot call people kafir, right? We have to be very, very careful. The Muslim does not have a personal guarantee of paradise. I've been condemned to hell many times by people of different religions, by the way. Many, I say, usually, you're going to hell. You know that about me? I know for certain. You're going to burn in hell. Really? Wow, that's amazing. Judge not lest ye be judged. Right? It's John. So, we don't have a personal guarantee. The Quran, the Prophet, peace be upon him, says, Man shahida an la ilaha illallah, dakhila, dakhila jannah, wa anna Muhammad Rasulullah, dakhila jannah. Whoever witnesses to that declaration of faith will enter paradise. It doesn't say, Ali fi San Ramon dakhal al Jannah. They say Ali from San Ramon is going to go to Jannah. I don't have a personal guarantee. Because when we have personal guarantees, then what happens? We start to act irresponsibly. I have two girls. I tell one of my girls, uh, if you're good, we're going to go to Disneyland in December. Oh, yes. I'm going to be good. So she tries, she strives. But if I tell the other one, I say, we're going to go to Disneyland and do, do whatever you want. You have that guarantee. Go do whatever you want. Then probably she'll be a little lax on her. So we don't have a personal guarantee. So the Prophet, peace be upon him, he said, be between hope and faith. Wear the two sandals of hope and faith. Don't be so hopeful in God that you start to delude yourself and become judgmental. And don't be so, uh, um, uh, uh, no, I'm sorry, hope and faith. Hope and, what's the other word? Fear. fear. Hope and fear. And don't be so fearful of God that you start going into despair. The Quran says in an imperative, La rahmatillah. You are not allowed to despair of the mercy of God. It is, is haram, it is as forbidden as eating pork and drinking alcohol and committing adultery. To be in despair, oh, how can God forgive me? I'm a terrible person. God forgives. God forgives if you make teshuva, you make tawbah. There's a beautiful hadith of the Prophet, peace be upon him. After one of the military expeditions, there was, you know, there was a battle, and this woman was running around frantic. She had lost her infant son. Little toddler could barely crawl around, right? And, uh, and this was in front of the, some of the companions. And then the prophets, and then the woman, she saw her son. She picked him up and started to hug him and breastfeed him. And the prophet said, do you see that woman? And they said, yes. And the prophet said, can you imagine that she would take her child and throw him in a fire? Can you imagine her doing that? 
And then said, La wallahi, by God no. And the Prophet said, Allahu arhamu bi ibadihi min hadihi bi waladiha. God is more merciful to his servants than this woman is to her son. God is more merciful. Rahmah, right? Dr. Ijaz, he said, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. These are God's attributes in the Quran. He is Rahman and Rahim, the most merciful. The root word here is Rechem, which is a Hebrew word also, which means the womb of a mother, where the fetus is enclosed. There's a beautiful analogy here. God is more merciful to his servants than the purest type of love on earth, which is the love of a mother for her son. I think I've exhausted the times, but again, it's not black and white. It's not kafir Muslim. We're not allowed to judge, right? If we be careful, we throw these terms around. God is the ultimate judge.